<laughs> good evening or good morning, depending upon where you are. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Robert Burke, and I'm a cardiologist over at Honor Health with the Heart Group, and I'm the director of non-invasive cardiodiagnostics, all the uh, non-interventional cardiology. And I'd like to introduce my good friend and colleague, Christina Royce. Good evening. I'm Dr. Christina Royce. I also work within Honor Health as the director of the Cardiac Service Line Quality Division um, in private practice, however, but welcome to this evening. We're welcome to talk to you uh, about primary uh, prevention in cardiology and healthy heart tips. So Christina, we've been talking to patients about this for probably longer than either one of us wants to admit right now. Uh, we've known one another since uh, fellowship over at Mayo Clinic and so we share a lot of the same background and common interests, although we've certainly had different career paths right now. We've come together with an interest in preventive cardiology and really trying to do what's equivalent to primary care cardiology. Um, yeah. How do you take it in your practice right now? You know, I, I would say it's nice to see you actually. It's, it's really nice to spend some time with you outside of just doing daily rounds. So it's uh, great to see you. Um, in this capacity, we get to spend some time talking about what we do on a daily basis. Um, since training, since Mayo Clinic training, I've, I've taken a different approach to how um, I practice day-to-day -day cardiology. So my practice is consists entirely of only taking care of, of female patients, so women in cardiology. Um, as a female cardiologist, I found that we're um, underrepresented in cardiology uh, training programs. And so coming out into practice, I felt that women patients were lacking um, seeing women doctors. So from my standpoint, day to day, that's who I see. That's my bread and butter, so to speak. Um, or we should say low carbs and olive oil. We'll get to talking <laughs> about that. But, um, you know, I, I would say the most common thing when people come to see me is they want to know where do they stand? You know, how, how do I look on paper? I have family risk factors and there are modifiable things that they want to try to really change in their favor because we know that there are non-modifiable risk factors. You know, they're getting older, um, they can't change their genetics, they can't change if they're um, male or female, and so they, that feels sort of helpless. What I do is look at things that we can modify, and um, and so th that's that's what I see a lot, you know, most commonly. Tell me about what sort of your day to day has been like. Well, very similar, and actually, I think uh, your vision has really put you ahead of the curve. You know, in fact, there was a recent article that came out in Jack, and sort of our uh, most commonly uh, referenced cardiology journal that really does put an emphasis on having women physicians taking care of women in order to have better outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think that you've been definitely ahead of the curve on that one. Uh, again, not too surprising knowing you. But uh, with that being said, it's much the same in my office. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I have my spiel with my patients mm -hmm. and you know, there are things that you can change in life and there are things that you can't change in life. Obviously, you can't change your date of birth, can't change your gender, mm -hmm. can't change your parents. You know, you don't get to choose those things. But like mm -hmm. you were saying, things that we do have an impact on, whether it's blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar, whether or not we smoke, those are all things that you can do voluntarily. At the core of everything that we do, I think, remains activity. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know that is going to impact all of the risk factors that bring people into our offices. And with activity, you have an impact on how much you weigh, mm -hmm. what your blood pressure is gonna do, where your cholesterol is gonna go, and what your blood sugar is gonna do. So all of those things, they can help to modify. Mm -hmm. And I think that that remains the one thing that when we talk about modifiable risks, probably has the, the largest uh, bang for the buck. I agree. Um, 
You know, the last last year's campaign, um, and for those of you who don't know, February is American Heart Association's Heart Month. So this is a big month for us to really um, get the word out on knowing your numbers, knowing your cholesterol numbers. And you know, some of the other numbers that I that I always tell my patients to, to really know, you know, and this is something that I do um, from from really from a young age with my own kids is know how to read a basic food label. And I don't mean that in an insulting way, but I find that to be sort of a fun thing that we do at the store. Um, and I will do this even with my sister. We'll each grab a can of, of, or a package of something and we'll each look at the nutritional ingredients and try to understand how many calories, how many trans fats, which we want to avoid, um, how many uh, fiber grams, which we want lots of, and I'll explain that, and um, how many uh, protein grams, you know, these kind of contents. And so just to start off with fiber, I'm gonna just point out one of the um, easiest ways to sort of on a daily basis to get your LDL numbers down and your global heart health, uh, your global cardiovascular health is to increase your fiber intake. And I'm not talking about going to Costco and buying a huge tub of fiber. Um, what I'm really talking about are fiber supplements is is increasing the breadth of foods that you eat that are high fiber. So these are the obvious things that we all should know about eating a rainbow of foods. So broccoli and yes, Brussels sprouts and all the things that you already know have high fiber, not necessarily all grains, but whole grains are incredibly important. And so the number that the cardiologist will ask you to aim for seems quite high, but you really wanna aim for 15 to 20 grams of fiber, which sounds like a ton, but when you can really increase to that level of fiber intake per day, you can decrease your LDL numbers, and then other things are also uh, better served. So you decrease your colon cancer risk, you improve, um, you improve ironically your sleep, your body weight, and so you know fiber intake is one of the easiest things to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's a good preventative. Um, and so tell me about exercise. How do you get people who say that they, they hurt and ache everywhere? So how do you start off with getting them to move a little bit more? So again, the, the most important thing that we can do is to get moving. And no mm -hmm. matter what we wanna do in this world, you have to walk to get there. Yes, you know, so true. no matter what you're gonna do, from the moment you get out of bed, you're gonna walk to the bathroom, you're going to walk to your kitchen. Walking remains the most important and most fundamental exercise that I have all of my patients try to do. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about walking, there's, well, you know, how active do you have to be? How strenuous is it supposed to be? Really, walking, if you can be doing that for half an hour to an hour a day, is really the absolute minimum that everybody should be doing. Mm -hmm. And this is a very manageable goal. Now, most of our patients are retired. You know, mm -hmm. it's just the community that we happen to live in. So asking them to carve out that hour, it sounds like a lot, and in some ways it is, because you know, nature abhors a vacuum and <laughs> there are always things to do and there are obligations and everything else. But for that one thing, people have to be selfish. They have to say, this is important to me and this is going to be part of my lifestyle. Walking is absolutely the most simple thing that we can do, and that is something that we should be doing into our 90s. Now, mm -hmm. is going out for a walk for half an hour really gonna make sure that somebody who's 30 years old, they're gonna be fit? Eh, probably not. So there has to be a gradation of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about strenuous, or at least modest uh, activity, it should still be conversational, mm -hmm. so that you do enough that you can still have a conversation, not necessarily going on and on and on like we do right now, but being able to talk and convey a conversation, and most most people in their 20s and 30s and into their 40s will be able to go out and jog mm -hmm. and do a pace that's not setting any land speed records or anything like that, but have mm -hmm. a conversational jogging pace. That's where they should be. Now, as we get older, that conversational jog is going to turn into a conversational walk, mm -hmm. and that's okay because ultimately, this is not a matter of training for the Olympics or anything else like that. Yeah. Um, there are lots of other things outside of just walking that need to be done. When we talk about fitness, muscular strength is important and resistance is also really important. That's important for men and women. And it's not just a matter of trying to look good on the beach or anything like that, mm -hmm. but it's making sure that the muscle strength is there and that we can maintain the ability to do what you wanna do. Mm -hmm. 
So again, for women, incredibly important with regard to bone health, which mm -hmm. again, coming from a cardiologist, sounds like a bizarre thing to bring up, but weight-bearing activities, they help to maintain muscle strength, bone health, all of that, and that is going to help to prevent other problems. You know, falls. Absolutely. You know, you don't want to fall because again, you're going to get in trouble, and if the bones aren't there, you can have a fracture, and it leads to more complications. Uh, so those are just some of the things that I bring up for all of my patients. Yeah, it's um, one of the things that we we talked about earlier in the week is you know there's this pendulum that always swings with um, with uh, different foods, and I just want to go back to one other food thing really quick, which is um, eggs, because this comes up a lot in the doctor's lounge. So. Um, I always giggle that in the doctor's lounge, you know, we are supposed to be a mirror of what we are telling our patients. And oftentimes, um, cardiologists, when asked in surveys, only about 44% actually follow their own advice. So, you know, we're oftentimes guilty of that as well. Um, but I look in the doctor's lounge and, and recently, I think even with COVID, a lot of us are grabbing foods to go and their foods in packages just quickly to, to shovel in your face and go. But um, I've noticed recently that there have been a lot more hard boiled eggs than usual. So I was looking at a, a study that was fascinating to me and I wanted to share that with you all, which was that looking at whole eggs, um, which would be including the yolk that has the saturated um, fat and cholesterol component. And so when you look at people who eat whole eggs, because patients ask me this all the time, how do you feel about eggs? You know, how, how do I feel about eggs? Well. And what I know is that I'll, I'll look at science and I'll try to make my best assessment in that regard and try to guide patients on that. So I try not to give my personal uh, opinion and whether or not I, I enjoy eggs or not. I think that it's important to look at science and guide patients in that regard. So um, by cutting back on every half of a whole egg eaten, you actually reduce your cardiovascular risk by 7%. So it's pretty fascinating if you just take um, whole eggs out of your diet and substitute either eggs, egg whites or egg substitutes, or even just substitute any other uh, protein in that regard, you can actually improve your heart health. Um, with regards to some differences in, in women and um, obesity, and you touched on a little bit of um, diet and exercise there, you know what's fascinating is the improvement in longevity in women who, um, put a little extra effort in, in weekly walking. So the magic number for women is six miles of walking per week actually has a bigger impact in their longevity than it does in men. So there's a differential. And um, you know why that is particularly, I, the, the science of why isn't as clearly understood. But I think that when we start to see these differences in gender, it's fascinating to understand that little things do affect um, sex is differently. And so... Um, you mean that men and women aren't the same? Men and women definitely are not the same. You're absolutely right. <laughs> um, tell me your approach to um, cooking at home with oils. Do you, do you, what do you guys reach for? Canola so oil, really olive oil? Really, it's mostly olive oil hmm. at this stage in the game. And that really does spring mostly from trying to go with more of a modified Mediterranean diet when mm -hmm. you can. Uh, again, with teenage boys, uh, that doesn't always pass muster, but um, you know, so there are different meals that get cooked at home and uh, uh, for them and for my wife and I. But realistically, olive oil tends to be an easy one to go to uh, as for most of the cooking oil. And um, it's an easy switch. I think it was an easy, simple thing to transition out. Um, I do tend to recommend as a diet type, more of the modified Mediterranean diet because people are familiar with that food. Mm -hmm. So it's not a major shift in lifestyle and uh, food choices. Those are things that you can find if you want to eat out. Yeah. Um, so it's not a really huge shift. Um, things like the Pritikin diet, which is a very strict vegan, mm -hmm. incredibly low fat diet, it works. There's no doubt about that. And that's uh, sort of the Bill Clinton diet. Now, the challenge with something like that is that it is very labor intensive. So you really do have to focus and a big part of your lifestyle is getting the food, cooking the food, preparing the food, doing all that stuff, and then also having enough variety so that you don't really get bored. Now, again, if you're like Bill Clinton, you've got 
people who are doing cooking for you and you've got people that are shopping for you and they can make different things every day of the week. So it is a manageable thing. In my own practice, I have one family that's been able to do that and it is really a lifestyle. So mm -hmm. it's not to say that a vegan diet is a bad thing, it's just that for many of us as Americans, it's a shift, it's a mindset mm -hmm. that you really do have to shift away from what we were all raised on that becomes challenging. And from the standpoint of providing uh, really advice to patients, the one thing that I don't like to do is set people up for failure. I think that if you ask too much up front, then things don't work out, there's frustration, and then it's like, well, the heck with it, I'm just going to go back to what I do because I'm comfortable with that, that's what I know. Um, I may not be good for me, but I know how to cook it. Exactly. So, and what do you do as far as those patients who come in and say, I really want to be on a high protein you know, low carb diet, Atkins worked for me in the past. Mm -hmm. How do you approach that now? Well, uh, it's interesting because I, I find that <laughs> I, I always tell patients, don't pick a diet that is a fad for you. So the one diet that works is the, the nutritional plan that is going to be sustainable for you. Except the processed food nutritional plan is not a sustainable plan. <laughs> So we, we have to move away from that immediately. Um, the reality is, is we have failed at educating people on the basics. So the food pyramid worked for sort of our 70s and 80s generation, even the you know, folks growing up in the 50s and 60s. But the food pyramid um, is really outdated. And, and what we need to follow is really more of an American Heart Association diet, a, a diet uh, with a broad range of um, high rich, or excuse me, um, whole grain, um, whole grain, uh, whole grains, excuse me, uh, legumes, uh, vegetables, fruits, um, minimal, minimal saturated fats. You know, lean, lean red meats are probably acceptable, but I tend to really push for um, high fish, you know, diets, high omega-3 rich diets. And patients will always say, I don't like fish, um, but I think we need to kind of think outside of the box. It's not just salmon, it's tuna, um, trout, it's whitefish, and it's just getting creative um, and trying to really broaden the palate. Because when you haven't really expanded your palate, you haven't really allowed yourself to think outside of the box. And so getting rid of the processed foods and just starting back at just the grocery, the, the vegetable aisle and starting from that. Um, these food delivery systems, uh, HelloFresh and Blue Apron, have made it really easy to get a little creative at home. Um, you know, COVID has allowed bubbles to exist now that, that probably have, um, you know, made us think differently about new, feeding our families and really bringing nutrition back into the home. Um, one area though that I, that I really harp on with patients is this issue of sleep because I find that with the overwhelming, um, daunting amount of uh, patients who are overweight and the amount of obesity that exists in our nation, that sleep is the biggest impact, um, negative impact. So what happens is, when sleep is undervalued, um, our health falls apart. So let me give you an example. Um, so in women, if women sleep less than six hours a night, um, in women, we tend to actually eat poor diets. So we tend to then, um, as a cohort, um, increase our amount of um, saturated fat foods and then metabolism worsens. And so it's a bad cycle. So it actually leads to obesity. And that's been looked at when you follow ghrelin or the satiety hormone. And so when you ask women, you know, set your alarm so that you know, just like you set your alarm when you wake up, you're going to set your alarm so you go to sleep on time every time and aim for seven hours of sleep. And you find that just by simply dedicating time for sleep, all of a sudden folks are feeling better. Their metabolism improves, blood pressure control improves. 
um, di digestion improves. And you start linking people with more of a circadian rhythm and they actually feel better. And I would say that that's an important thing. So even in men, I, I do a screening and always say, well, what's your neck size? And if the neck size is bigger than 17, we know you probably have sleep apnea. You are going through a sleep disturbance at night where the oxygen levels drop. Um, if you're snoring and your partner is elbowing you, you probably have sleep apnea. And these are conditions that really negatively impact your cardiac health. You have more atrial fibrillation. You have a higher risk of stroke. You have a higher risk of dying. So for me, um, also as a cardiologist, I'm asking about sleep. And it's a funny conversation to have, but it's actually a really important one. I find that I get a lot of interesting information out of people. Yeah, that's actually an excellent point. And I think that most people are familiar with sleep apnea, you know, mm -hmm. so they've heard about it. And there are certainly stereotypes of who has sleep apnea. Big fat guy, nodding off, you know, not making it through the movie, not making it through TV, mm -hmm. falling asleep while they're watching that stuff. Unfortunately, that stereotype, I think, really does detract from management of sleep apnea and screening for sleep apnea, particularly in women, mm -hmm. uh, because women aren't supposed to have it. So, you know, from the beginning, women are thought to be almost immune, which again is foolish. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, the myriad effects of sleep apnea, like you're saying, are very, very real. It's an inflammatory condition. And in our world with cardiology, inflammation is always bad. And whether that's inflammation that's brought on by your own body, or brought on by what you eat, um, it's never going to be a good thing. Sleep apnea is terribly inflammatory. All sorts of hormones go up, adrenaline and cortisol and all those stress reactions, because basically you're suffocating several times at night mm -hmm. and your body is trying to respond to that. And the easiest thing and the most common one that I think that I see in my own practice is high blood pressure, because the body gets revved up by this lack of oxygen that happens intermittently, and then all those hormones, those levels go up. Mm -hmm. You know, not to levels that you'd find with, you know, certain tumors and other weird things, but they definitely do go up. And then trying to manage that, our response is always, well, we can give you a medicine for your high blood pressure, but mm -hmm. if that's not the fundamental issue, we're really putting a Band-Aid on a much bigger problem. Absolutely. And I think your, your comment about, you know, neck size, in men is incredibly well taken. The challenge that we have is that pretty much with most of our screening tools like stop bang and stuff like that, once a guy is 50 years old, it's a coin toss mm -hmm. regardless. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just so common. Mm -hmm. So I think that your, your concept of sleep hygiene though is something that most people haven't heard about mm -hmm. and saying, look, you really do need to value those hours in bed and our society doesn't appreciate that. There's no return on investment. You're not getting paid for sleeping. You don't <laughs> do anything. There's no productivity associated with mm -hmm. going to bed and making sure that you are in bed at 10 o'clock at night and then sleeping until six in the morning if yeah. you can. It's in some ways, it's actually viewed as a weakness. Um, I think that I've had quite a few patients who are like, well, I can, I get by on four hours of sleep and I do just fine. I mean, yeah. what's, what's oh your thought goodness. on that? Um, you know, it, I've always found that really funny because in, tra in training, you know, we, we still were part of the, the era where you had the unlimited work restricted hours. And so we would, we would take our shift and then we'd just go straight into the next work day and then we'd stay on until the end of the work shift and then you'd go home for a few hours sleep, come right back the next day. So mm -hmm. the amount of sleep deprivation was pretty intense. Um, and you know, I, I feel like I felt it a lot. I mean, I certainly know that I looked like I felt it. Um, so, That's why we do that in our 20s. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you do your training when you're young so that you can hopefully uh, not remember it. Um, but, you know, there, there were some really fascinating studies looking at people who try to uh, catch up on their sleep. So making up their sleep deficit um, and say, well, you know, I'll do an all-nighter to study or to read uh, or to catch up on something and then I'll catch up on the weekend. And ironically, when you try to catch up on your sleep debt, um, you actually are never really as truly refreshed as you think you are. And then selfishly, this is 
how I was sort of thinking about it. When you look at the studies on burning calories, you actually burn more calories by just sleeping on time every night um, as opposed to you burn less calories when you stay up late and then do the, this catch up on sleep. So, you know, it's in an, in an era where, where many of my patients are asking me, well, I try to reduce my calorie intake and I'm trying to exercise more and I, yet I cannot lose this weight. For me, the answer is, how are you sleeping? because many, um, many of those patients will answer, I'm not sleeping enough. And so um, sleep hygiene is incredibly important. So usually what I always advise them is you, you have to, at some point you have to turn the TV off, turn the noise off, put the blinders on your eyes um, with the sleep mask and really even get those, the lights off from your phone, flip everything over because all of that is a very stimulating um, input to your brain and to the back of your um, brain in the pineal gland, and that's what releases melatonin. And if you're inhibiting your body from releasing melatonin, you cannot get through a sleep cycle. And so, you know, from a cardiovascular standpoint, it doesn't make sense to me ever why you could start the day off not feeling refreshed. And so it's no wonder that we see more strokes happen at three in the morning, heart attacks happen at five in the morning, you know, blood pressure rising throughout the middle of the night. I mean, all of that has to do with the sleep patterns that people are going through that have been completely ignored. Um, and that probably is why, um, hypothetically, when we look at our studies looking at medications, when we take blood pressure pills, and you know, we're always advising people take it at night. Um, there are time, many times throughout the night that are being unchecked with high blood pressure. So um, the field of sleep medicine is fascinating. It's an area that not really cardiologists actually practice, but it's a field that sleep doctors have come out of pulmonary medicine and neurology. But I think that's one that um, affects our field certainly on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, it's funny that you bring that up because you know when we were in training, there was one problem <laughs> with sleep, and that was sleep apnea. There was one treatment, and that was CPAP. Yep. It was, you know, fighter jet mask, and you're doing your stunt double for Tom Cruise in Top Gun. Um, and because it was that simple, everybody was an expert. Unfortunately, like so many things in medicine, if you've got one problem, it only has one solution, and yeah. everybody knows everything, clearly we have no idea what we're talking about. That's a good point. So, you know, this has evolved into... A myriad and truly like you said it's a specialty area right now and generally done by pulmonologists lung doctors and it really has taken on life its own and it needs to because it is fundamental to everything else that we want to do and if you wake up in the morning and you're exhausted the likelihood that you're going to have the energy the desire the drive mm -hmm. to get out go for a walk go for a run do something goes down a lot so then you really have to force the issue, again, of trying to get back into more healthy habits. You know, whether that's just going out for a jog in the morning, going for a walk, going for a bike ride, getting on your treadmill, whatever it might be, that is a much bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate because the answer could be as simple as, look, 10 o'clock is lights out and that's what we're going to do in the house and that's all that you really need to do. Yeah. I wish somebody would have told me that um, before I had kids. And then I would have reminded them that's the rule, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so just for the viewers, we're going to do Q&A in a little bit of time. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the um, question comment box below. We have folks that are monitoring and will ask the questions. Um, I'm going to put Dr. Burke on the spot here because I, I had a fun question asked of me this week. And um, don't worry, I know that you'll know your answer. Um, but if you were stuck on an island and you could only eat two items for the rest of your life, um, just two items, and it would be the same two items forever, what two items would you pick? And it could be anything, and there's no, there's, it doesn't even have to be scientifically sound. You could just pick your favorite. Please don't say Twinkie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, lots of, lots of uh, trans in that. That would be bad. Uh, only two things. Gosh, that's a tough one. Because, you know, water is going to get boring after a while if that's the only <laughs> thing you get to drink. 
That would be a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> it's true. Uh, is this two foods, or do I have to pick a, a beverage and a food oh, yeah, on this point. one? Oh, yeah, good point. Let's do two foods. Okay, oh, all okay. right. Good point. I mean, yeah, I think I think my son picked, like, a food item at a store. So, you know, he was cheating because then he could pick it apart. So. Oh, um, that would be really smart, actually. That's mm. a clever way to do it. But um, two items. Gosh. You know, the question is, from a vegetable standpoint, what's going to be interesting enough that you're not incredibly bored all the time? Because, you know, there's only so much romaine lettuce you can have, and then you really need a lot of <laughs> other stuff to manage the, the micronutrients. Um, and you can think about it, and then we can come back at the end. But, I mean, I just think it's a it's a... It's all right. You can think about it if you want to. I don't want to put you yeah. on the spot too much. I didn't actually give you any Probably, time. you know, if I had to pick a protein source, probably like tofu. But do we have, mm. uh, we have the ability to have condiments or other stuff that we can play with? <laughs> it's or am I eating everything have raw? one other option. <laughs> <laughs> and it could be sriracha. I mean, everybody <laughs> seems to love that. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. But that would probably be my protein. I think that's, that's the most... Uh, malleable one. All right. Well, we didn't put pro we didn't think about tofu for our talk today. Um, we yeah. may have to have a whole separate one on that. Um, you know, and I'll think about my other item. Yeah, yeah, good point. Well, I had my two picked out and I can tell you that people that know me really well said, well, yeah, of course that that's of course what you picked because they knew me and people that didn't know me thought that I was just lying. But, um, but I'm going to tell you my two because I really feel like I could actually live off of these two. I'd be totally happy with them, completely, and I'm not lying. It'd be avocado and green apple. I'd be so happy. Um, I there really would be. I just want you to know that. So throw me on an island with avocado and green apple. I might be going on crazy after a week, but at least today it sounds good. <laughs> um, but, but for sure, avocado, because you would have a very low amount of unsaturated fats. You'd mm -hmm. get protein, apple, why not? And high fiber, a little tart, good yep. for your gut, right? Prebiotic. I think I could do it. I mean, I, I don't think I'd have a lot of followers at well, this point. <laughs> I think, you know, again, the, the, it's a great hypothetical question. It's just, you know, as far as getting into the whole micro, macronutrients, prebiotics, all that stuff, probably two things aren't going to get anybody through for the rest of their life. But, That's a uh, good point. You know, there's a lot that needs to go into it. Um, one thing that you had mentioned was about processed foods, and I think that really gets into things that have a shelf life of forever, um, mm -hmm. your, your Twinkie example, I think, was probably the best one. Can you explain to our, our viewers what, what that means as far as those trans fats and why, oh, yeah. you know, why are they bad and sort of where did they come from? Why do we even have them? Do they exist really oh, in gosh. nature? Yes. Oh, Lordy. Um, so here's the problem. First of all, thank goodness, January 1st, 2021, um, the uh, FDA officially put an end to adding um, partially hydrogenated oils to foods. So I think we're going to see a big shift in, um, in fast food or processed food management. So that's actually a really nice thing. So that'll help us for long-term um, health for our for general public health. However, no, um, saturated fats and polysaturated um, fats, these, these very processed foods, where did they come mm. from? I think almost everything comes from corn at some point. Um, yeah. But incredibly processed foods are really designed to kind of fill us up and addict us to foods. I think that's really, they're designed to give us high calorie, high sugar foods, um, and really provide some degree of quick energy. But the problem is, is that the downstream effects is, is a quick insulin spike, at insulin release, and then, and then you get a little addiction quality. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, um, I, I will share with you that um, as a joke, I, I did tell my kids I don't ever want them to eat a Twinkie. So on my son's 14th birthday, he, he actually said, can I eat a Twinkie for my birthday? And I said, you know, it's your body, your choice. And he did. And he was like, meh. You know, so I, yeah. I kind of think you, know, you can't really restrict kids or even your patients, but I think you have to educate that, you know, when you're eating foods, you have to think what's a nutritional value and what's a potential bad or harmful yeah. value. You know, this and, is this is exactly what you're saying. You know, those those trans fats, you know, and things like stick margarine, which was sort of the 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 evil 
uh, stepchild that was born of all this stuff. Things that just don't go bad, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's a big part of it is that these foods were designed that they don't spoil and that they're not going to, that they'll have a great shelf life, you know, mm -hmm. you can have a Twinkie forever, <laughs> you know, it's not going to go bad, you don't have to worry about it. But those aren't natural and the fact that they aren't, our bodies don't process them very well. Really, yeah. they're not a good option for us. There are some that are sort of found in nature and that's where you get into the whole palm oil thing and using mm -hmm. that for deep frying and stuff. Generally not a really good option mm -hmm. though. And again, I don't think that we've advocated deep frying anything mm -hmm. at any point in time here. Yes, no, I agree. And uh, and actually on that line, um, there, there are definitely great studies looking at if you, uh, and, and recently take, looking at 500,000 people. And if you actually take 500,000 people and you, uh, and this was a really beautifully done just study looking at if you substitute out butter, partially hydrogenated oils, which is margarine, and mayonnaise, and you equally substitute out for the same amount of olive oil, you actually reduce heart disease risk by 7%. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, and it's seven ounces of, or it's actually, sorry, seven grams of olive oil, which is really a half a teaspoon. So we're not talking about much for substituting out olive oil. And, and every study looks at that, and that's looking at men and women. So that's the, the nurse's health study and then the physician's study, and when you follow those folks. So I think there's, there's great benefit in, in um, substituting out olive oil. Um, there are not any studies looking at the other oils, um, coconut oils yet, um, avocado oil, uh, ghee or clarified butter officially, you know, um, an Indian uh, clarified butter. So we can't say that cardiology knows everything about uh, different oils, but really just avoiding the butter, the margarine, and the mayonnaise. So mm -hmm. there's a lot there. All right, I think we're gonna start with our Q&A. The first question is, can you recommend daily habits to practice that will keep my triglycerides at heart healthy levels? Oh, to keep the, okay, sorry. Let's start with that again. So can we recommend uh, heart healthy daily habits to keep the triglycerides at heart healthy levels? So yeah, absolutely. Um, first things first, let's talk about just, let's not ingest too many triglycerides, okay? so. Um, when we talk about ingesting triglycerides, they're the basics. And I would say what I've done, this is exactly what I've done for my family. So I put a sticker on their fridge of the things I don't want my mom, for example, eating because they raise triglycerides. So I don't want her too much cream, whole milk, let's avoid the whole fat cheeses. So the easy things, and honestly, too many, you know, too many hard liquor drinks. So let's avoid things that raise triglycerides abnormally high. So no more Cheesecake Factory, guys. Um, however, so that's ingesting. And then the next is adding things to your diet that pull triglycerides away. So we know that substituting out, so we just talked about substituting out margarine and butter for olive oil. That's a great way to lower triglycerides. Um, the next would be increasing fiber in your diet. So those are really simple swap outs and it can't really get any simpler than that. Just looking at the very small adjustments. The other thing that people need to recall is that, you know, with other disease states like diabetes and if somebody has trouble with blood sugar control, that blood sugar is also going to impact triglycerides. Okay. So managing to keep blood sugars under control and even simple carbohydrates can have a downstream effect with the way that our body metabolizes things and can raise triglyceride level. So that needs to be looked at. And again, that falls back into exercise and having good glycemic control and making sure that you know you keep those blood sugars under good control so that mm -hmm. you don't end up with higher triglycerides. So there's still a plug for physical activity, regular activity and exercise in order to help with that glycemic control and also the triglycerides right there. Yeah, I like that. What are ways that um, we can better monitor our heart rates at home? So monitoring your heart rate at home really depends upon what you're looking to do. So the easiest way is with wearables. You know, if you really want to get right down to it, lots of people have, you know, an Apple Watch, and that is something that can be done. Um, but the question is, why do you want to even monitor it in the first place? Some people have rhythm problems where their heart rate can go very fast, uh, things like atrial fibrillation, 
And so being aware of that, because you've got 100,000 heartbeats a day. If you mm -hmm. felt every one of them, it would drive you nuts in very <laughs> short order. Um, we get asked a lot about, you know, oh, I felt my heartbeat, it was, I had palpitations. What does that mean? It just means you felt your heart rate. Monitoring your heart rate for the sake of monitoring your heart rate really doesn't provide much of a benefit um, on its own. Monitoring with exercise activities may have some benefit. Again, it really depends upon what your goals are and if you're trying to train for an event, then that can be critically important. Mm -hmm. But for day-to-day -day stuff, I really don't ask my patients to monitor. What, do you, what about you, Christina? No, no, um, especially if you don't have disease, I think that um, just allowing yourself to go through a normal exercise regimen without obsessing over statistics is probably the best way to, to do it. But people enjoy looking at their own data and their own numbers. So what I tell people is if you're going to look at any of these things, a heart rate monitor, uh, distance you've run, how many calories you've burned, how much elevation you've ascended during a hike, look at it for uh, background trends and, and simply just be aware of what your trends are so that should you notice an aberration, a change from the baseline, and you also have a symptom that seems very abnormal, that would be a great way to say, hey, I've had a change and I also noticed a change in my pulse. That's something to say, well, maybe I'll get that checked out. Um, it doesn't often help us when people bring in huge tables of data, but what does help is when you say, normally I'm at um, 60 beats a minute, and then I was sitting there and I noticed I jumped up to 180. Well, that's very significantly different, and, um, and that does actually help in that regard. So I'd say um, most of the time it's great for feedback, and, um, and, but just use it as such, just like any other piece of information. Yeah, actually, that you brought up an excellent point, and that is physical activity, whatever it is that you do, whether it's you go for a hike, you go for a walk, you have your routine, you have a, a bike route that you like to do that takes half an hour or an hour, whatever, that is really your baseline. Mm -hmm. And the only person that that matters to is you. That's really it. You're not check checking this against somebody else. You're not trying to run the uh, uh, ride the Tour de France. But that remains the barometer by which we are going to judge what's going on with your heart. Mm -hmm. So if you know that your activity level is at this, and then it's either taking a longer time to accomplish your route, right. or you're having to cut it short because you're running out of gas. Those are shifts that we want to know about in order to, again, try to stay ahead a little bit on any developing heart disease or problem. Okay, next question. I have a family member who died of a heart attack at a young age. Is there anything that I should be doing differently? Okay, so family members that die at a young age, and what can you do differently in that case? So there, there's actually a specific number that we think of as a cardiologist for dying at a young age, because um, at some point you have to sort of define that. So how we define a young age, in a, in a male, a family member who dies less than 45 years old, definitely that is a young age. In a female dying um, less than 55 years old, that is dying at a young age. So that's how we define it based on sort of cardiac definitions. Now, we get it. When grandma dies at 69, that's unexpected, and that seems young. Um, so those are, the, those are the numbers that we look for. So for us, that's sudden cardiac death. However, absolutely, no matter what your age, if someone dies um, in the family and it happens to be not the numbers that I just discussed with you in terms of age cut points, then I think the absolute basics are you've got to make sure you have a general doctor. Okay, if you don't have a primary care doctor, you definitely need one, okay? You don't have to see a specialist as a cardiologist as your first doctor, but we love it, so absolutely. Um, but you want to call and you just say, I want a general visit. And what we do is we would do an EKG to look for any signs of heart rhythm disturbance, any signs of heart muscle electrical damage. Uh, we would do a blood pressure, physical exam, listen for heart murmurs, listen for abnormal pulses, um, anything in your history that sounds a little suspicious to us. And then depending on that, we may do some diagnostic testing. And absolutely, blood panel is the first way to go. And we ask you to not eat for a certain number of hours. Yes, we want you to drink water, and we'll do a blood test. 
and we'll start to look at what are some of your risk factors. And oftentimes we'll plug that into a risk calculator and come up with your atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk score. And we compare that to a database of hundreds of thousands of people and calculate what is your risk versus what is the optimal risk for your age and gender. And that's how we kind of size you up. And oftentimes, simple things, using your body mass index is really helpful because we know that certain diseases hit harder at certain body shapes and body types. So I think just showing up in the doctor's office is a huge step. So uh, I commend you for asking. So again, that's really the most important thing is actually seeing a doctor up front. Primary care physician is where you wanna start knowing what your blood pressure is, what your blood sugar is, what your cholesterol is, all of those things are critically important. They will almost invariably get an EKG, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. And if they send you, or even if they want to on their own, for people who are really high risk, what I've found in my own practice is that screening for coronary calcium now has been a very useful tool because our risk calculators remain imperfect. Our world is not a perfect place. But I like to have imaging, and again, mm -hmm. I'm biased, obviously, because that's what I do. Um, but I like to have imaging to look at the heart and know what's going on. And a calcium score is really, it's a fancy x-ray. It's a CAT scan, but there's no IV, there's no contrast, there's no risk to kidneys or anything. But you can quantify whether or not somebody has any disease mm -hmm. and use that that really shifts people within different risk groups to, okay, you may eventually develop something to, guess what? You have something and you're asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. And that's been a very helpful tool in, in my own practice. I agree, yeah. So, so that's um, called a, cal a coronary calcium score and feel free to um, talk with us about that. And it's really done best kind of in, in the higher risk patients. So we don't love it when people just go willy nilly and get their own tests because you wanna try to put it into context. You mean like that whole body it. scan from yeah. head to toe of everything known to mankind? No, yeah, no whole body scans. You get a lot of radiation with those. So it, I know you guys both just touched on um, diagnostic testing. Uh, what about um, which patients would be need a stress test before they begin an exercise regimen? Okay, so which patients <laughs> need a stress test before exercise? Um, it's actually a really fair question. So we both see different types of patient populations. I'm going to let Dr. Burke take the first um, portion of this question. So who needs a stress test before stress testing? Because a large chunk of Dr. Burke's practice are athletes and also touch on the ho Hocum yeah. patients or HCM. So when we're talking about the general population, if somebody's already exercising, there's probably not a huge benefit to repeating what they've already done a half a dozen times this week. They go to Orange Theory for an hour a day. Uh, they hike Pinnacle Peak on a regular basis. You know, getting any real value to doing a formal stress test probably is not going to be all that helpful. That's where we're going to do things like EKGs and maybe an ultrasound of the heart to make sure that there's no structural problem that they might have been born with. Uh, but for the general population or somebody who hasn't been exercising, Christina, how would you approach a woman who hasn't been exercising, you know, has been taking care of the kids, they're now in high school or they just moved out, has not spent an hour on a piece of equipment or taking care of herself for the past 15 years. How would you approach that? Oh my goodness, that's my entire day today, taking care of patients <laughs> like that. You know, it, it's actually really fun to, um, to for this exact kind of patient. So um, a lot of times women will come to the office and they're not really conditioned, but they also don't feel like they wanna go and start an exercise program without understanding, is it safe? Um, how hard can I push myself? You know, if I, if I push myself really hard and my heart is racing, does it mean I'm, you know, hurting myself? And so this is where, for me, what I usually try to do is we start off with an EKG and I listen uh, for heart murmurs. And, and what I try to do is start off with an echocardiogram or an ultrasound. And, and that is a beautiful test because it gives you physically, you can see your heart beating, you can measure all the heart chambers, you can measure the aorta, look for aneurysm. Um, and, and I really think that that's just for, for me as a patient, I would want to see what my heart looks like. It's very reassuring to know all parts look normal. 
um, a stress echo in that situation is very helpful because not only you get on a treadmill, we can measure how hard you can push yourself. What is your exercise response to stress? Like how hard can you can you exercise and what does your heart rate do? But then after, when you reach that peak heart rate, let's see what your heart is doing. If the heart is working harder and faster, first of all, we know that your risk for an arterial blockage is incredibly low, but it also gives that woman the reassurance that when you feel your heart beating like crazy, this is what it's doing and it's looking fine. You just need to work up to that conditioning level. Mm -hmm. So I tend to screen probably a, a little more often than than most, but in that setting of trying to guide someone through an exercise prescription, it for me an exercise test is very helpful. I agree. Um, and I agree. so we you know we individualize it to say, okay, you're going to you're going to pick this much of a heart rate. I want you to work at this many miles for the first two weeks, and then work up. Mm -hmm. All right. Last couple of we questions. We mentioned a lot about walking. Um, what are some of the things that people can do if maybe they are not mobile enough to get out and walk? Can they use a stationary bike, or what are some of the other things you recommend? Oh, absolutely. So if you are not able to walk, bad hips, bad knees, uh, bad feet, bad joints. Um, well, first of all, we have a lot of other uh, exercise equipment. You know, with COVID, people have talked a lot about buying um stationary bikes at home, or even there are tri trikes or tricycles you can buy, um, and there are supine bicycles. You've seen those people on the path, and there are arm ergotomers, so um, resistance bands and small weights. I would say with this is a whole different ball game than even 10 years ago. You can go on YouTube, and you can you can search any single thing you want. You can type in the words sitting exercises and you will see every single type of exercise. But I find that simple things in Arizona, we need to take advantage of the outdoors. So you need to be either be outside, um, either sitting outside on your patio and doing weights, resistance bands or pool exercises. And um, you can follow on YouTube and find some pool exercise links. Um, uh, tai Chi is a wonderful way, um, even simple meditation. Honestly, anything you can do, I find that any human can do an activity. So Dr. Burke, what do you recommend? So just like that, I think that we have a lot of different things that can potentially be done. I think that, you know, for our patients who are Medicare age, you know, Silver Sneakers has many different programs and they do a lot of uh, water exercises, pool exercises. Mm -hmm. For those people who have arthritis and other mechanical problems that are going to limit them from being able to go out and do the hiking, do the walking that they want to around their neighborhood, uh, being able to get into a pool where you unload the joints, where people can actually get around and do something where they still get mm -hmm. an aerobic benefit and they're actually doing stuff is fabulous. I thought your points about using resistance bands, that is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Because again, you don't need a lot of space. Mm -hmm. They take up no space. Mm -hmm. And you can really change the level of resistance very quickly. Mm -hmm. And to your point, YouTube has almost everything you could ever want mm -hmm. with resistance bands. So very easy and relatively cheap. So the next question is, um, how, sorry, how critical is sodium in a heart healthy diet? Oh, yes. How, How critical, critical is <laughs> sodium in a heart healthy diet? Well, I would say um, sodium has been beaten into our heads as, as an important, uh, low sodium has been beaten into our heads as the one way to stay out of the hospital, let's put it that way. Um, since training, we have seen patients come um, back to the hospital with recurrent heart failure when they take in too much sodium. So there is a concept that everyone needs to understand called being salt sensitive. And it's not that, you know, uh, you're uncomfortable around salt is that truly you may have well-controlled blood pressure numbers, but the moment that you had taken too much sodium, either good Chinese meal, good Mexican food, um, or anything too much Himalayan sea salt on your food, and now all of a sudden you've retained fluid and you've become very um, sodium logged. So I would say the magic number is 2,400 milligrams or less of sodium per day, and that's a total number. And if people feel overwhelmed by all of these numbers and you think how in the world do you remember it I can tell you that over time you know you'll start remembering it but it's just a matter of turning over and looking at the serving size nutritional content 
But again, everything that we've talked about today is also on the American Heart Association website, and it's under our DASH diet information. What about caffeine and coffee? What about caffeine and coffee? Aside from the fact that we can't live without them, I don't yes. know. Um, you well, know, caffeine and coffee. Yeah, there's um, so, some great data. You know, last, last week we had our electrical doctor, Dr. Doshi, talking about caffeine and stimulation to the heart. I'm going to make an argument for um, coffee from a different perspective. So coffee, I think of as a complex substance with not just caffeine, but other um, additives that include polyphenols and um and other substances that actually have some benefit in lowering LDL and increasing HDL. And it, it actually, what I would tell you is the, the downside to the current state of coffee is that it becomes very complex, right? We have coffee houses that make our beverages with some highly processed um, sugars and whipped um, milks and all these kind of things. So if you just looked at straight coffee, um, the studies that are the purest, which are just observational studies, looking again at the nurses' health study, which is about uh, 100,000 plus people, and the physicians' health study, another 67,000 people, and you look at what is the magic number, about two cups of coffee uh, per day, and that's seven ounces of black coffee, uh, was probably a safe and if not cardiac beneficial um, intake, um, and that had more to do with the caffeine intake. And so you could substitute that out for um, black tea. And so those are really the only numbers in terms of coffee. But uh, I have not seen any data to say, um, you know, brand X um, Starbucks or brand X coffee bean and tea leaf is any healthier. Um, and there are some complications of excess caffeine and stimulating the heart. Yeah, so in moderation, like so many things, Coffee is great, caffeine is great, not a problem. Again, some people are going to be sensitive, and if that's the case, then you know, getting rid of caffeine can be important. Um, when we talk about coffee, the real data comes from just looking at coffee and not looking at the mocha frappuccino grande da 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 da, da that I can't pronounce, uh, which has you know, 20 grams of fat and mm -hmm. 60 grams of carbohydrate Absolutely. and is no longer coffee but it's really a dessert that you're drinking. Absolutely. Next question is, um, are there safe and reasonably effective over-the-counter sleep aids that you'd recommend? Aha, uh -huh. safe and reasonably effective over-the-counter sleep aids that we'd recommend. Um, I will tell you, I don't have any go-to sleep aids that I recommend over-the-counter. As a matter of fact, Benadryl, which is commonly used in, um, in our older patient population, um, folks will tell us that they take Tylenol PM, and that's usually the effective agent in Tylenol PM. I, I tend to ask my folks to avoid because over long term, Benadryl is not probably the safest thing to take long term, especially with Tylenol or acetaminophen intake can be toxic on the liver. Um, what I tend to ask people to do if they've not worked through the sleep hygiene tools that we've talked about is first start with a small melatonin dose. And melatonin is naturally produced in the pineal gland in the back of your brain. And it generally is produced in small amounts of one to four milligrams. So you really can start very slow. Um, I tend to ask people to even start with simple things like teas and calming teas like chamomile. So, um, I, I really don't recommend a lot of over-the-counter purchased pills, but that's just my general practice. Yeah, so exactly like that. I think that if they're going to be taking anything, what I've seen from most of my patients is that melatonin tends to work well. Uh, to your point, uh, Benadryl, um, diphenhydramine is generally not a good idea because of side effects. Mm -hmm. And make no mistake, it is a sedative, and also people have been actually... Uh, charged with driving under the influence with something mm -hmm. as simple as Benadryl, and even though it's been around for forever, it's not entirely be benign. So mm -hmm. I would generally avoid that one. Mm -hmm. uh, last question in the evening. We're talking a lot about uh, heart health and heart month and prevention. What types of symptoms should people, if they're having right now, not wait? Should they you know, seek medical attention to see their doctor or the emergency room? You know, what do we want to leave people with? Oh, absolutely. I'm going to just, I'm going to talk to the ladies out there who are listening and I'll let Dr. Burke speak to the, 
to the men out there, um, especially to the ladies out there. If you're experiencing something, and I'll tell you what I commonly hear, all right? So I don't have a lot of ladies that tell me they feel chest discomfort. Um, I have a lot of female patients that will tell me they feel a sense of that they hit the wall when they start to walk or exercise. They feel sometimes symptoms in the shoulder, in the arm, or they feel like somebody's pulling their arm. Sometimes they feel overwhelming fatigue when they walk or when they push themselves to do a repetitive activity. If you're feeling those symptoms every time that you do a repetitive activity and it comes on with very predictable now um, occurrence and it goes away with rest, that's a very worrisome symbol or sign for me. And I would much prefer you go to the hospital, go to the emergency room. We can easily check things out there, get some basic testing. If things look benign, I'm happy to see you in the office. You can absolutely see a cardiologist in the office setting. So if you feel like you don't want to stay in the hospital, but it really needs to be addressed and it should not be ignored. And you shouldn't think it's a panic attack and you shouldn't think you're crazy and you should get it looked at. And so I encourage you to please listen to yourself and listen to your body. And so to dovetail on that one, I think that the critical stuff, the 911 stuff is going to be the same for men and women. Going about your business, everything is fine. And then all of a sudden, bam, something happens. There's pressure in the chest. There's heaviness. You can't breathe. You're sweating. You're nauseated. Those kinds of things that really come on from out of the blue and you haven't had them before, regardless of whether or not it's chest pain. And um, both of us can tell you how many times people will tell you, well, I didn't have chest pain. It was an ache. It was a pressure. It was a discomfort. But it wasn't a pain. Okay, I'm not sure what you're really trying to tell me. But if it doesn't belong there and it feels like the end is coming soon, that is a 911. <laughs> do not pass go. Do not collect $200 to the ER and you're done. Thank you so much. And